lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Eveling. Well, I want to start by welcoming new members to our listener community in our Facebook group. The group is called the Still Growing Podcast Group, and all you have to do to find it is go into Facebook and click on the search bar and type in Still Growing Podcast Group. And then even though it says that it's closed, all you have to do is click to join And once I verify you're not a spammer or a robot, I will definitely go ahead and add you to the group. New members this week include Jan Johnson, Michelle Schaefer, Diana Heaney, Julie Thompson Adolph of the blog Garden Delights, and she's also a guest on this show, Chuck DeGarmo, Michelle Duncan Wilson, who is a blogger out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and she also has a podcast called Soul Work for Moms. And that podcast is dedicated to helping women grow and learn through mothering. So if it sounds like something you're interested in, give it a listen. Diane Violet Brown, Shermer Shireen, Lynn Buhlman, Carla Deanna, and Gail Eichelberger, who is also a garden blogger out of Nashville. She blogs at Clay and Limestone, which is a blog dedicated to wildflower gardening in Middle Tennessee. So welcome, you guys. And once again, the listener community on Facebook is called the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's a great place to ask questions. You can share your own garden stories, interact with the great guests that are featured on Still Growing, like Julie Thompson Adolph, who is also blogging at the garden blog, Garden Delights. And you can connect with listeners of the show. And it's also where I will post all of the awesome garden giveaways from my guests and sponsors. And our winners from last week's show are the following five folks that are already in the group. Elizabeth Cook, Trisha Ackerman, Nicole Hale Van Harrelveld, Michelle Schaefer, and Maureen Fitzgerald. Congratulations, you guys. You were all picked to win the 100 bulb gift sets from Color Blends. And these are the spring loaded daffodil blends. So since you're already in the group, all you have to do is private message me with your address information, and I'll make sure that those bulbs are sent to you right away. So congratulations, you guys, and enjoy your daffodils. Well, the Facebook group is also where I post curated content that I find throughout the week. This week, I've shared a couple of different articles. One is on Autumn Seeding by Organic Life's Doug Hall. And he wrote a little blog post on the types of seeds that you can plant in autumn for a second flush of color and bloom in your fall garden. So that's a great one. I also shared a wonderful picture from my friend Yolanda Timmons, and she was standing by her canna lilies in her garden, in her Minnesota garden. And we've gotten so much rain this year. And these cannas have to be seven feet tall, just quite the season for cannas with all the rain and humidity we've had this summer in Minnesota. And then finally, this last thing I've shared is a recipe that the kids are loving right now, and it's caramel apple nachos. So I take my apple peeler core slicer from Williams Sonoma and I spiralize those babies and then add great things like caramel and uh, little nuts, chopped up pecans, what have you. And the kids are loving that. So my other tip is if you're going to make that ahead of time, make sure you spritz that with some lemon juice so that the apples don't turn brown. But it's such a great snack. And I'll make it ahead of time in the morning and then just cover it with saran and put it in the fridge so it's ready for the kids when they come home and they absolutely love it. Well, this week is the third week of our book club and we're reading Marta McDowell's All the President's Gardens. So this week's blog post for our book club is on chapter three, and it's called Gentleman's Occupation, and it's covering the time period between the 1810s and the 1830s. So the blog post will include things like supplemental questions, if you're using this as a tool in your book club um, for to provoke conversation, you can use it that way. And then there will be some links to some videos of that time that I have curated from YouTube. So go ahead and check that out if you're following along with the book club. 
And of course, you can let us know what you think of the book and the book club series by posting in the listener community on Facebook. Well, did you enjoy last week's show with Tim Shipper from Color Blends? The party continues this week. And this week, we're talking to Joanne Vandenberg Ohms of Van England, John Sheepers, and Kitchen Garden Seeds. And once again, I'm joined by my garden friends, Jen McGinnis of the blog Frau Zinni, Julie Thompson Adolf of the blog Garden Delights, and Susan Vollenweider of the History Chicks podcast and also a columnist for the Kansas City Star. And this week, it's Joanne's turn to hear our picks from the Van England catalog. And once again, we had a tremendous time just chatting about bulbs with each other. Now, to celebrate the show, we've done two things. First, there are t-shirts that you can order. Just go to sixfootmama.com and you'll find the t-shirts there. It'll, I think it'll say t-shirts shirts in the menu. But the t-shirts are two options. One says Team Daffodil and the other says Team Tulip. And it's uh, commemorating the first annual spring bulb show on the Still Growing podcast. And then the second thing is there's a post that I've created called How to Host a Spring Bulb Party, just like I'm going to do this Thursday. So if you're interested in doing that and you want some tips and ideas on what you can do to make it fun for your guests, go ahead and check that out. That's on my website at sixfootmama.com as well. And for today's show, I think you're going to love listening to Joanne. You know, just like Tim, Joanne is super passionate about bulbs and she should be. This is a family business. This is something that is a point of pride for generations in her family. You know, one of the things that Joanne shared with us is that her great uncle is or was John Sheepers. And he had kind of an extravagant approach to business, including having a an office on Wall Street uh, back in the early part of the 1900s. And one of the things he did is he created his bulb catalogs as bound books. And you can still find them on eBay. And as Joanne was sharing this with us, I was searching on eBay because I knew that I wanted some of these um, old Beauty from Bulbs books. That's their title, Beauty from Bulbs by John Sheepers. And you can get them and they are jam-packed with the cutest little anecdotes and poetry about bulbs, including information about the bulbs that were available at that time. But these are true little gems. So if you want to get your copy, go ahead and scrounge around online on eBay or antique sites, antique bookshops, that type of a thing, and you will probably find one. One that I was lucky to track down was the 1929 version of Beauty from Bulbs. And it starts out with this little article called The Four Blessings of the Garden. And I wanted to read a little excerpt for you because it was just so cute and and such a reflection of the time in which it was written. But it says, the first blessing of the garden is the benediction of a tired body. We tire in many ways, we modern people, but the demands and complications of our civilization rarely leave us animal tired. We tire in exhausted nerves. We tire in worry. We tire in bewilderment. We tire in ambition. But being healthily tired in a body is quite a different matter. And being tired in a body from gardening is a form of exhaustion that carries its own peculiar blessing. It is in the weariness that comes from the thrust of the spade and the clouding of the clod. It is the weariness of patiently handling infinitesimal seeds and tiny seedlings, of the entombment of bulbs, and the arduous labor of setting out trees and bushes. It is the bending and the kneeling and the constant play of hands that the nightfall bring a healthy, placid animal exhaustion and sound sleep as its award. And then later in the book, at the very end, he's talking about the superior quality of John Sheeper's bulbs. And he says, give your garden ideal the same chance that love suggests for your human children a good start. The purchase of superior bulbs is an insurance toward this end. In this day of intelligent effort toward better gardens in general and an increased knowledge of how, where, and what to plant, it naturally follows that little need be said of the beauty and satisfaction to be derived from planting not merely bulbs, but the best bulbs. Isn't that charming? Well, that's just part of the John Sheepers Van England Kitchen Garden Seed story. And I know you're going to love this interview with Joanne Vandenberg Alms. 
Well, I want to welcome our special guest tonight from Van England, Sheepers, and Kitchen Garden Seeds, Joanne Vandenberg Alms. And this is part two of Still Growing's first annual Spring Bulb Selection Party. Joanne, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your connection with Van England, John Sheepers, and Kitchen Garden Seeds. Oh, thank you so much for having me, and um, it's a subject near and dear to my heart since um, Van Anglin and John Sheepers and Kitchen Garden Seeds are our family's businesses. It's a family-run company, and our staff also feels like family. We have bulbs and seeds and cooking in our blood. I'm the fourth generation of this Dutch family. My father came over here after World War II and continued the Dutch family business of specializing in flower bulbs in the United States. Wow, that's awesome. And we were talking before the show that the way your name is hyphenated, the very last name, Ohms, is actually your maiden name. Absolutely. Um, In the Dutch way, one's maiden name continues to be your last name and your husband's name is hyphenated before your maiden name. So I chose to keep my married name in the old-fashioned Dutch way so that it would appear rightly so that I was doing the right thing in the ears of the Dutch flower bulb growers in the Netherlands. I love hearing stories like that. You know, my own family is from Holland My on my oh. father's side. So my maiden name is a Dutch maiden name. And uh, my grandfather, uh, his parents had come over and started farming in Iowa. And after six months, they were homesick. So they went back to Holland. They both had very big families in Abenbrook. Oh. And my grandfather remembers they had made enough money farming where the family could afford leather shoes. And when he went back to Holland, he's wearing leather shoes to school. Well, when the boys had a disagreement, they would take off their wooden shoes and hit each other with them, but he had (laughs) leather shoes. So his memory, yes. So his memory of being in Holland was running home away from the boys with their wooden shoes in their hands. And when by that time when they had been back in Holland, they realized that they were doing better in America. So they didn't stay. And they went back to uh, Osceola County, Iowa, and they uh, decided to settle there. And uh, my grandfather never had a desire to go back to Holland after that. But my uh, great-grandmother and my great-grandfather and all the siblings had... Uh, many, many trips back to Holland. And so I think my dad probably remembers a little bit of Dutch being spoken. That's my Holland connection. That is such a great story. And it's so funny because my father, he was actually born in the United States because his parents were here from the Netherlands selling flower bulbs. And so they were here selling flower bulbs. They were strictly Dutch citizens. But they were in the United States selling Dutch flower bulbs when my father and my aunt were born. And they went back to the Netherlands where my father was raised, I think when my father was age four. In those years, the Dutch flower bulb representatives would come over by boat, many times crossing the Atlantic, also with flower bulbs in August, September. And they always would congregate in the same hotels in different major cities. And there were wild stories about all the Dutch flower bulb salesmen from those years way back in the 1920s, 30s, and on up. Wow. And they're tall people. They're the tallest people per capita in the world. In the world, absolutely. I feel very comfortable over there because I myself am quite tall. Not as tall as many of the Dutch women, but it's a a very nice feeling. I was always the tallest in school here, but certainly not in Holland. So it's a it's a fun uh, dynamic. Yeah. Well, I'm six feet tall. I, I literally am, I am right on the nose. And uh, one time I got done interviewing a guest uh, from Peaceful Valley Grow Organic. We got all the way done with the interview. And this is Sarah Griffin Bubakar. And she goes, 
I have something to tell you. And I said, what? And she goes, I'm 6'1". <laughs> <laughs> she beat you. <laughs> she beat me. She beat me. But I had gone to Germany as a teenager. And I all I'd ever heard about on so many uh, sides of my family was our German ancestry. And I thought when I went there, I'd feel something. And I really didn't. And then I had an opportunity later to go to Holland. And I'm walking around and I'm like, oh, there's my dad. Oh, there's my brother. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I have found my people. So yeah, it definitely yeah. felt like home. Felt I like know, home. it's a great feeling being there. Yeah. Tell us the Van England John Sheepers and Kitchen Garden Seeds story and your special place in the American bald market. It really goes back to my father and his family. When my father came here after World War II, he worked for his father, who was here as well. And then my father started his own little company called Yana Films Incorporated. And dad went up and down the Northeast Coast, um, calling on all the major old, you know, blue blood American families, um, working with either the, um, the owners of the estates themselves or the garden superintendents. And he would sell bulbs to all the private estates from Newport, Rhode Island, down into the coast of Virginia. And um, that was really how he started selling flower bulbs himself in the United States. In the 1970s, my father started Van Englen. It was a Dutch company that sold its American arm, and my father bought it for a pittance and grew it into a wholesale flower bulb collection, um, really diligently striving to promote the diversity of flower bulbs that are grown commercially in the Netherlands for American gardeners. Up until that time, I would say that tulips and narcissi and hyacinths and crocus perhaps were known to American gardeners, but there's a whole vast array of other special miscellaneous bulbs that my father started importing into the United States and promoting. And he really fashioned it in a way that it wasn't, you know, buying a tulip for the price of a horse or a narcissus for the price of an Amsterdam canal house, but focusing on volume and very fair prices but the best quality that the Netherlands harvest could afford each year. That is extraordinary. Yeah. He was really quite, I think, forward-thinking in his approach toward flower bulbs. At that time, there were other flower bulb catalogs in the market, but the breadth of the flower bulb selection was not as complete as it could have been. And my father really focused on making a complete collection. Some catalogs in those days and even today have a, a special formula whereby they determine if a flower bulb is carrying its weight in a catalog and they measure the inches according to the sales and is it worthwhile or not. And we've never done anything like that. We feel that being a flower bulb specialist means to carry the full range and breadth of flower bulbs because as I said, it, it's, you know, every flower bulb has its own special place in, in a garden and every garden looks different according to the, the personality of the family, according to the microclimate, according to um, weather patterns, the horticultural zone, wildlife, you know, and then our hills. So it, it changes, and every flower bulb has a, a place in American gardens. It's just a matter of the choices and the selection. Wow. It sounds like your dad really had a big impact on the culture of your organization still today. Oh, absolutely. Sadly, my father passed away five years ago, but we continue with everything that he stood for and everything he represented in terms of the quality of flower bulbs and constantly searching for ways to expand the diversity of bulbs that are available here. So he started Van Englen back in the 1970s. And in those years, it was in the basement of our family's house mm -hmm. and, and the, the attached garage. So 
We were never parking cars in the garage in the fall or early winter because they were full of bulbs. And we all grew up, my three sisters and I, who now um, own the companies, we grew up helping out as best we could. Some of it wasn't very attractive work, cleaning the basement or counting jiffy pots or cleaning up broken cases of fish emulsion. But we all, you know, really learned from the ground up what it meant to you know, supply plant material and, you know, different goods to American gardeners. I keep thinking of uh, Shark Tank. The whole time you're telling this startup story, starting it out of the garage, and then also uh, hearing about how your dad was going door to door. Mark Cuban would have loved that. He loves when an entrepreneur is just pounding the pavement to try to sell their product. And your dad was really a true entrepreneur at heart, it sounds like. He absolutely was. And so going back to a little bit of the family story, if I may, my father's, his father, my grandfather was selling flower bulbs. My great-grandfather was one of the the Netherlands' most well-known hybridizers. It was the nursery of Kneidenberg and Mark that is now disbanded. It was broken up, I think, about 10 years ago. But our family had flower bulb fields in the Netherlands. And they were renowned as hybridizers in the country. And they introduced many of their own hybrids, which are still popular and going strong today. Narcissus Ice Follies is one of them. Mm. Tulip Land Vandermark was named after my father's cousin, uh, my uncle Lane. So it was a, a family business that continued through World War II, I think into the 80s. And John Sheepers was my father's uncle. And okay. John Sheepers, yeah, John Sheepers came to the United States in the late 1890s and he met an American woman and they were married and John Sheepers and his wife Rose settled in the New York metropolitan area and he started the John Sheepers Beauty from Bulbs Company in around 1908. And at that time, John Sheepers, Johannes Schapers, as they say in Dutch, he was publishing the Beauty from Bulbs catalog as a leather-bound proper library book with watercolor plates and effusive um, flower bulb poetry. And it was quite a publication and absolutely beautiful. And he had the John Sheepers Beauty from Bulbs office on Wall Street at one point. He created a off like garden in Long Island called Paradu in Brookville, Long Island. And some people even say that the off was patterned after his idea of having a destination public garden so that Americans could see flower bulb exhibitions with their own eyes uh, so they could see what they could do in their own homes. Oh, my gosh, Joanne. I had no idea. I have to say, uh, it might sound a bit um, harsh, but... From everything I've heard about my great uncle, John Sheepers, he was a bit of an egomaniac. I mean, having a a flower bulb office on Wall Street and the proper suits he wore were quite impeccable. And printing one's catalog as a proper bound leather book with, you know, hand-colored watercolor plates was quite something. He passed away and... It was always a heartache of my father's that the company had left the family. And so in 1990, my father was thrilled when his childhood friend, Hilvaneda, asked my father if he'd like to buy the John Sheepers Beauty from Bulbs Company back into our family. And so my dad did that in around 1990. Wow. So it was finally all back together again. Finally all back together again. I would love to have one of those bound books. I want to see one. Do you have They're any? They're absolutely beautiful. Um, well, it's it's so lovely. Uh, clients over the last 20 or 30 years, as they, you know, maybe clean out their parents' attic or they go through um, family belongings, they find them. And I have a collection of them from the 1920s and 1930s. <sighs> wow. And they're just stunning. They're just such treasures to me. And one client uh, mailed me a wooden crate that John Sheepers had shipped the bulbs in, and it had John Sheepers burnt into the wood. 
and I, I'm constantly on eBay looking to see what John Sheeper's memorabilia is going online. And I have several original magazine ads that John Sheepers had put out in the 30s. Then they're very special to me. And they're just, you know, all the heirloom antique varieties of tulips or narcissi and, Hmm. you know, encouraging Americans when they had victory gardens during the war to not just plant vegetables, but to plant flowers and banish the horror of the war from the family's mind and um, just creating a whole atmosphere and magic around the importance of flower bulbs in the spring. It's a good thing now, in hindsight, that uh, your great uncle had the kind of personality that he did because the flamboyance is paying off. The quality and the way that he approached it, you know, the pride that he had in it, that's why these things have stood the test of time. It was immense, and he had a huge impact on the trend or the practice of gardening in the United States. He was able to donate a million tulip bulbs to the New York World's Fair in 1939, and he donated a quarter of a million tulip bulbs to the San Francisco Golden Gate Exposition in 1939. So he made a real effort to educate people and help them learn how easy it is to plant flower bulbs and the magic of planting in the fall and experiencing the beauty and the color and the joy in the spring was no effort at that time. And what's very sensational about that is think about how close that is to the timing of the Great Depression. I mean, it wasn't even 10 years after, and he's donating a million bulbs to two major events. He had some help with the flower bulb growers in the Netherlands as well. He was quite the spokesman in the Netherlands for American gardening, but he really rallied so much interest and phenomenal energy behind incorporating flower bulbs into gardens here. Wow. Well, let's get on with today's show. Uh, Joanne, before we do, I have to say thank you because that is just way more than I thought we were going to be talking about. And it's just a treasure that you shared that with us tonight. So I really appreciate that. That was just amazing. So we could do a whole show just on your family history, I have a feeling. Oh, God. That's pretty tremendous. Very, very special. I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the show that we're doing right now. And uh, before we dive into how we're going to handle the rest of the episode, (laughs) talk to us a little bit about the relationship between Van Englen and John Sheepers. So when we're ordering out of the Van Englen catalog, for instance, there are no pictures. But if we want to see the pictures, we can either go to your website or they are in the John Sheepers catalog. Can you talk about how those two are maybe interrelated and also what that means for listeners of the show if they want to order bulbs? Oh, absolutely. Our clients often, from year to year, might place their order in John Sheepers one year, in Van Englen the next, maybe the third year order from both companies. Van Englen Company is a wholesale company, and Tulip White Triumphator, for example, would be available in a box of 50 from Van Englen, whereas in John Sheepers it would be available in a bag of 10. Tulip Dordogne would be available in a unit of 100 through Van Englen, but again, available in a unit of 10 from John Sheepers. So it has to do with the minimum unit size that's available through Van Englen or in John Sheepers, depending on what you need for your garden that year. Okay. And there's progressive volume discounts in both companies in our warehouse from a physical perspective, the two companies are separated so that we have one part of our warehouse devoted to the beautiful little bags of bulbs and John Sheepers where it's 10 of this and 10 of that. And then in Van Englen, it's a much larger warehouse space, as you can imagine, when it's cartons of 600 of this or 600 of that um, or, you know, huge crates of, of narcissi and mesh bags. So it has to do with the minimum unit size. In Sheepers, we have exhibition size amaryllis and lilies. So it's one size or one year larger than those offered in Van Englen. Oh, really? Yeah. 
So the sheepers bulbs are more mature. Amaryllis and some of the lilies. So what it means is that in sheepers you can buy a 34 centimeter amaryllis bulb. You can buy one of them, whereas in Van Englen you would purchase three 30, 32 centimeter size amaryllis bulbs. Okay, I see. Thank you for that clarification because I know even as the four of us were just kind of corresponding about it and, you know, how we approached it. So this was very helpful to have you go through yeah. that. Very helpful. And all the photographs are available on both websites. Yes. Yep. All right. Well, tonight we had so much fun, by the way, going through. We limited ourselves to five choices out of the Van That's England. Hard. Yes, that is very hard. It was very hard. It was especially hard for Julie, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right away, she was just aghast. Yes. Um, if you get if you go on Twitter and you look at some of our Twitter conversations, you'll see that we're all just dying over the fact that we have to limit ourselves to five. So um, my first list was twenty three. So getting it down to five point five. Well, and let's be clear, we're we're just picking five each of us for the show. That that is that has nothing yes. to do with ultimately what our order will be. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If you ever look at my past orders, you'll see. <laughs> they usually, are. I'll have my twenty-three. It'll be on there. Oh boy. <laughs> we're going to have them do is each one just spend some individual time with you. They're going to offer up their selection one at a time. And then after each selection individually, we'll have you comment on okay. what you think of that choice. Um, I'm sure it's like picking your favorite child, right? But still, you know, pros <laughs> and maybe th some things to consider. That would be great. And then if they each have a few questions, they can ask you uh, follow-up questions. And we'll work our way through in this order. We'll start with Jen McGinnis of the Garden Blog Frau Zinni and then Julie Thompson Adolph. Uh, of the Garden Blog, Garden Delights, and then Susan Vollenweider of the History Chicks podcast and also Kansas City columnist. So Jen McGinnis, do you want to start us off? <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for including me on this bold bonanza. <laughs> and I agree, it's been really hard to narrow it down. So this is, this is a lot of restraint right now. <laughs> I guess what I'll start off with is I'm always very big on daffodils, but this year I'm trying to expand my typical gardening experience. So I'm trying to think about prolonging the color because I find that my garden looks great like in early spring and then there's this gap between when the last tulips and daffodils go down and then before the peonies come up. So I'm trying to be good in considering that. So I chosen the first one was um, an allium and I, it was graceful beauty. That's a fabulous variety. Really broken onto the American stage, I would say in the last five years, although it is an heirloom. It, it was originally registered, I believe, in the late 1850s. And word has it that it was an American native. It's a terrific choice. It's a wonderful perennial, and it has extremely beautiful, graceful flowers. I actually grew it in my own garden this spring. I was thrilled with how it doesn't stand up straight like little soldiers. It has its own little way of weaving and dancing in the garden. And oh. the they're composite flowers that are kind of like a silvery white with a lavender pink tinge to them. And I absolutely loved them. They bloomed earlier than Allium azureum, um, the blue of the heavens. Um, okay. But you might you might want to think about interplanting it in you know like drift side by side. The combination of that cornflower blue with graceful beauty was just fabulous. And they're both wonderful naturalizers. Deer don't eat them. Rodents don't like them since they're in the onion family. And they're also great cut flowers, so I can't applaud your selection enough. It's terrific. <laughs> and it was wow, long-lasting. It, it seemed to bloom forever. 
That sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's really great. Perfect. Now I have number 24. Good grief. Now I have to add that to my list, too. <laughs> well, technically 24 and 25 because you have to tear it up for right. the blue of the heavens. <laughs> there we go. Just, just one um, word, one little tip. Some people are really fastidious weeders. And if you or your family come into that category, don't let them near that area because they might not differentiate the slender stems from something they need to remove. Ooh, so right. Just make sure that nobody touches those babies. Mm. <laughs> Good point. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that would be tragic. <laughs> I don't think the words fastidious weeders really apply to my family. So I think we're good. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you look at my front garden right now, you'll see there's there's nothing uh-huh. fastidious out there right now. <laughs> I, I hear you, my friend. <laughs> All right. So I guess um, for choice number two, I went back to my daffodil roots and I chose sweet love. And I've oh. actually grown this one in the past. Yeah. But I think I put it in the wrong spot because I originally had it growing along my driveway and it looked beautiful the first year. But I think after we had all those monster snowstorms where we had to clear the driveway like, I don't know, a thousand times, I think it just got too wet. So yeah. my plan this year is to not put it anywhere near the driveway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Driveways can be killers for flower bulbs because of the excessive snow melt, as you suggested. But also, if you or your family ever put down any ice melt or any type of chemical de-icing solution, flower bulbs don't like those at all. <laughs> they don't. They yeah, it makes, don't like makes it. sense. Yeah. <laughs> so we try. I try to keep flower bulb plantings away from any road or surface that could have any de-icing solution. <laughs> Okay. Oh, but man, sweet love. It's so deliciously fragrant. And that little flower is like a little Fabergé, you know, sculpture. It's that that cup is so perfectly formed and it looks outward right at you. It's just amazing. I love it. (laughs) Yeah, I... I loved it too, and and I was sad that my own stupidity is what did it in. But I I plan to have this one for many many years now, and it's one of those flowers that when I think of spring, I think of that daffodil. Like I don't think of the big bright yellow ones. I think of that like perfect little dainty one, and it just it photographs so well too. So of course that makes me so partial to it. <laughs> yeah, of but you raise an interesting issue that. When one loves flower bulbs, they want them everywhere in the spring. And everywhere is a great concept, but it it doesn't always work for the bulb. Um, So it has to be neutral pH, well-draining soil with, I would say, a minimum of six hours of sunlight a day. But Mm -hmm. I also don't think that's a hard and fast rule. That's kind of like a a general um, statement. Because more filtered sunlight can help flowers last longer in the spring, particularly if there's any heat spiking. So I think that some thought does need to be given about where you're planting all these beautiful little varieties. Sounds good. And speaking of thinking placement-wise, I have a hosta bed out back. And um, I'm not sure if it was voles, which are like on the top, you know, top three number one enemies here in my garden in Connecticut or <laughs> or if it just got <laughs> if it just got too dry but I had originally planted um I'm gonna say it probably incorrectly uh skill squilla Scilla, uh, yeah yeah the Siberica one yeah Scilla Siberica Spring Beauty yeah yes and I I don't know what happened but um I want to I want to get more. So given that I have voles in the garden, I wasn't sure if if that was the right way to go for the the blue in the springtime or if I should do the, um, I'm going to say this wrong too, (laughs) Shindoxia. Oh, yeah. That's that's what I meant. (laughs) How do you you say that? How do you say that, Joanne? I say Kionodoxa. Kiona Doxa. Okay, like all together, day. ladies. Kiona, Kiona, Kiona Doxa. Okay. 
I know that people generally say that voles, I mean, so moles dig the tunnels and they mm-hmm. eat grubs. Then the, the lazy voles use the mole tunnels to go in and eat annual or perennial plant material roots. Right. Yeah. In, in my experience, sometimes, even though voles are not supposed to like certain things, I think sometimes an odd vole here or there might start nibbling on something they're not supposed to like. Um, but generally, voles do not like eating muscari roots, narcissus roots, psylla roots, chionodoxa roots, allium okay. roots. But again, you know, deer aren't supposed to eat narcissi or fritillaria or allium. But I think that if an animal is starving enough, they're going to try nibbling on anything that looks like it could be munchable. Um, they might not continue eating your whole garden, but they might munch every now and again here and there. But I'm wondering, do you think that the hosta leaves were covering up the little cella? I think, well, this year, it was it was last year that I tried this experiment. So I think that by the time the hostas came up, they were already blooming. So I don't know if it was just like a bad site type of thing. Yeah. It's very popular to interplant flower bulbs among hostas. Hostas can have extremely rigorous rooting action depending on the variety and the type of soil and how closely they're planted together. The same thing with hemorrhagalis. And flower bulbs don't like being pushed up out of the soil, and they okay. need their own places to um, grow mature roots. And then after the root growth and after they flowered the first year, their foliage needs to stay open to the sunlight for a good six to eight weeks, depending on the weather, for um, the photosynthesis period and the production of chlorophyll. And if they okay. don't get that good chlorophyll feeding, the bulb can be diminished in strength and vitality for the future. So as much as it's so fabulous to have stuff coming up through hosta, sometimes it might only work for one year because they really don't get the nourishment from the sun enough to help grow the bulb for the future. And Joanne, you mentioned Hemerocallus, which for listeners would be common name. Daylily. Daylily, yeah. So daylily and hosta, if you're planting bulbs, um, heed what Joanne just said. I I had never heard of that either. So I feel like we're getting a continuing ed class here, ladies. Yeah, this is great. It's like, now I I know what I've been doing wrong. (laughs) Well, bulbs bulbs need, you know, they need some elbow room to to thrive. Yeah, I think I took for granted the fact that they were so tiny that I thought I could just tuck them in wherever I felt was good. (laughs) So I I know that was the case. I did the same thing with Allium sparocephalon, the drumstick Allium, um, two years ago. I have this little sanctuary feeling. It, it's an old stone bench. I dug out a huge granite slab out of the garden. Unfortunately, it was put in there in 1860 as a, a rain-off-the-roof splatter block underground. And so then I had to deal with all the rain flooding the basement after I removed this wonderful granite slab bench. But we do wow. still have the bench, and I planted all ferns behind it, and it's absolutely beautiful. And then I thought, oh, it'd be great to have drumstick allium coming up in the summer through the ferns. Well, the ferns just were too sick, and they also have pretty significant roots. And so I, I had my drumstick allium for one summer, and I think I counted instead of like 400, like six of them this summer. Oh. Wow. Oh. Yeah, they were just, they were absolutely overtaken by the ferns and they gave up. And wow. you know, so I think part of it's also kind of experimenting and, yeah. you know, seeing what you can do and what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, some things work when you least expect it. Um, hopefully you haven't planted something in such a massive amount without experimenting first because then you don't want to be crying too many big tears mm-hmm. over something. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember, remember, ladies, when I told you before the show you should have a box of Kleenex handy. I had no idea. 
We were really going to need them. <laughs> Crying over my drumstick alley. I tell battle. you what, that brought a tear to my eye, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of bulbs to plant. Oh, 400. That is a lot gosh. of bulbs to plant and then have that happen. In the oh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess if if I if I had to pick like one of them, which one would you recommend? Um, is there one that's better than the other? Cause Usually, I mean, you can't kill Psilocybericus spring beauty if you bang it with a stick. So I think I'd okay. <laughs> Psilocybericus spring beauty, um, <laughs> and it's also I, I believe it's a, it's a more economical planting as well. Kionidaxa okay. for best eye blue giant is a relatively new variety. And it's absolutely fabulous. The flowers are larger than the species Canadoxa for best eye. Um, and I love it, but I would probably plant that in a more proper garden, sandy loam type of soil. And Psilocybericus spring beauty, I mean, they can even reseed. So they're not just perennials, they're naturalizers. And they grow from the little baby bulbs attached to the mother bulbs that you plant. And when they, the plants themselves become so mature, they can also self-sow by seed. So I think from a naturalizing perspective, Psilocybericus spring beauty would be the best bet. Wow, yeah, that definitely sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. so well, thank so you for helping me make so up my so mind love. on that one. <laughs> You're welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so my final two, I said that, I should probably reconsider my love of tulips because of the voles and the moles and yeah. the neighbors who come by and help themselves to like cutting it off oh. <laughs> on their way off from work. But I can't. No. So, um, <laughs> so my last two are both parrot tulips. And I believe it was last year I jumped into the parrot tulip craze and I totally see why they got so much attention and so much love yeah, <laughs> back in the, the crazy, what was that, the 1600s that that happened? I remember reading about it at some yeah, point. There, there were some of the old Rembrandt tulips that suffered, if you will, from broken tulip virus. So each tulip had an active virus in it, which is no longer permitted, of course. And they would appear in all different forms and colorations and stripes and fringes and scallops and they were quite flamboyant. They were most often seen in cut flower arrangements at that time, and also in Dutch master paintings from the 17th century. They were immensely popular. Yeah, I, I totally could see why. <laughs> no, they're absolutely gorgeous. Tulips by nature, by Mother Nature, are not perennials, with the exception right. of species tulips. Um, I would say... Some of the, the Kaufmanianas and Gregeis, which are considered more botanical in nature, and also giant Darwin hybrid tulips, which have incredible strength and vitality. So the parrot tulips are really like the peacocks of the tulip world. I mean, they strut their stuff with such flamboyance and ornamentation. So I would consider them more as annuals. Um, which is yeah. also kind of fun because you can change the way your garden looks every year with such incredible gusto and bravado that the parrots give you. And also they're amongst the best cutting flowers for, you know, ornate, bright colors with amazing, intricate form. I would definitely agree with you with the, with the beauty. I think last year um, I purchased from your company the Flaming Parrot. And that was like the gateway. So, <laughs> so I'm back. And, uh, <laughs> Can I tell you yeah. a story about Flaming Parrot? It was probably, I don't know, 15 years ago, 17 years ago. I was visiting um, one of the largest flower bulb growers in the Netherlands at that time in North Holland. And it was a brisk, not quite cold, but definitely brisk day with a a sharp wind that you could feel the cold right to your bones. But it was brilliantly sunny, and oh, man, what a day. And I walked into this field of tulip flaming parrot. And I'm in the middle of this field, and as you know, the Netherlands is about as flat a landscape as one can imagine. 
and it's bigger sky country, I think, than Montana. It's like huge sky country. I stood in the middle of this field, and the wind started picking up. And oh my God. every horizon around me was tulip flaming parrot. And as the wind picked up, the entire world started moving and shifting because all of the tulips were moving in the breeze. And I stood there and lost my balance. I got vertigo from the whole world moving like that. And I I (laughs) fell right over. (laughs) I just, boom, I'm down. And I can't tell you how many acres I mean, it was, I don't know, eight acres of two oh. flaming parrot. Oh, my, oh my gosh. It was, that was, it was really. Wow. Cool. Talk about being <laughs> overcome with beauty. My goodness. Totally, yeah. I was totally <laughs> overcome. <laughs> but, and I, but I wasn't even embarrassed. I just picked myself up, brushed myself off, wow. rescued, my, <laughs> rescued my camera. <laughs> Take a little bouquet for the road. <laughs> I kept going as if I try. I did it on purpose. Oh so my goodness! It, oh my gosh! Wow! I, I, that must have been amazing. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah. But I digress. Wow. <laughs> that was a good digression, okay. though. That was a good I was story. Say, that's a great digression. That was wow. great. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god! Your description of imaging, like I can see myself there (laughs) it was just i have to say if have any of you guys been in the bulb fields in the spring no i'm dying that is bucket list bucket list for me yeah same here you have to go i do garden riding but i do travel riding too so i'm trying to see if i can swing something with a Holland, some CBB. <laughs> oh, you have to do it. It's so incredible. And um, oh, yeah. it's just, it's life changing. <laughs> Whether you go to the Kirkenoff, the National Flower Bulb Display Garden, or mm-hmm. if you go into the north, um, I mean, years ago, nobody was allowed to go into the bulb fields. But now there's an area of North Holland where the big, huge bulb fields are. They've moved farther north since the area around you know, uh, Nordwijk and Amsterdam and Harlem, that whole area has become so densely populated now, and it's so very busy. So most of the huge bulb nurseries, flower bulb fields, are in the the north of the Netherlands. But now they have this wonderful program. It's in the area of Zypa, Z-Y-P-E, and they have a month or six weeks of programs where you can go on bicycle tours through the bulb fields. Um, You can go on painting classes, walking through the bulb fields. And for people with disabilities, they have special programs for little trolley tours. And, oh, it's just fabulous So that, you know, normal human beings can experience what it's like now. It's just terrific. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, ladies, who's going to come babysit my children so I can go do that? (laughs) (laughs) Any volunteers, please? I'll I'll send my children over. My children can babysit your children. (laughs) Then we just need someone to babysit both our children. We're all alone and you and I'll go. It'll be fun. That's a good idea. And you can all stay stay in our little house because it should be fixed up by then. Oh, my gosh. (gasps) Yay. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. We're so there. (laughs) I know it. Okay, we're going to make a date. After this program, we're going to figure this out. (laughs) Works for me. (laughs) Wow. Oh, my gosh. What were we talking about? Parrot tulips? Yeah, parrot (laughs) parrot tulips. Okay, so so I'm uh, going to try silver parrot because I like flaming parrots so much. (laughs) And then um, rococo, is that how you say it? Um, yeah, Rococo is one of the um, most strange tulips. The form is so incredibly not tulip-like. I mean, if you think about a <laughs> tulip, it has like a classic goblet shape or a chalice shape. Rococo right. is so otherworldly and ornamental. It like it almost like turns its back on regular tulips. It's it's just so incredibly fringed and scalloped in the most unusual form. 
Um, and when it's in a bud form, you have no idea what kind of flower it's going to be. And then it opens and you're like, oh, my God, what is that? It's really, <laughs> wow. it's, it's, a, it's a conversation piece, really. It's, it's quite spectacular. And it has a, a purple, it has purple striations in it. So it's not like a dense red. So it's, you can still take photos of it because it has some purple in it. Like a solid reds are really hard to photograph. Yeah, they, mm-hmm. they definitely are. Yeah, so Rococo oh, is a great choice for reds and beautiful over-the-top flower arrangements and taking photos of them. Oh, that sounds right up my alley, Beth. <laughs> yes, it does. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I am all about the color and I'm all about photographing the color. <laughs> and, it's, and silver parrot, I mean, pink and red together are pretty fabulous. And silver parrot does have that silvery white in it as well. So it offers a, a good contrast in two ways. And it's, it's, it's kind of a, I wouldn't say it's a new variety, but it's new to be available commercially. Oh, okay. So that's also a really fun to have something that not everybody else has. Yeah, that's awesome. definitely wow. a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Would you pair them together or would you keep them separated? I think all flowers go together in the garden. It depends on what you're going for. I mean, it definitely would be like a passionate explosion of with the pink and the red. I might not do it myself because silver parrot is also prized because it has um, marginated foliage. So the, the foliage is marginated with also a silver narrow little strip. So the oh. foliage of silver parrot is also very ornamental. Okay. So that's, wow. it's, yeah, it's really beautiful. I'm pretty sure it comes out of a variety, a triumph tulip called New Design. Okay. So it's, you know, it's a hybrid cross of a parrot tulip. I forget which one. So it's a hybrid cross of a parrot tulip and tulip New Design that has the marginated foliage. And it has kind of the coloration of um, New Design as well. Well, I am so excited now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I think technically you already answered my questions because I digressed on the the voles. I think you covered everything I was going to ask about. Thank you so much for your feedback and your recommendations and your lovely descriptions. My goodness. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> Total pleasure. I, I would love to have the passionate explosion of flowers in my front yard. It's just going to be my new goal. <laughs> I can't wait to read Jen's blog post when she swoons in her driveway and falls over. When she rolls up her bulbs all blooming at once. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, next up, Julie Thompson Adolph of Garden Delights. Julie, what were your top five picks and questions oh, for Joanne? So, so hard. First of all, Joanne, you have the best job ever. Oh my goodness. I'm just I'm just over here just drooling with envy, even though I know you work like crazy, but your knowledge is so amazing. I am just I'm a complete tulipaholic. I love them. You know, if anyone ever gave me roses, my husband's learned a long time ago, don't give me roses, give me tulips. It's just, yeah. you know, those are my, that's my flower. But I live in South Carolina, which is really a challenge for growing tulips, especially if you want to try to make them be a perennial tulip. So I, I always treat them as annuals. I mean, I just have to. So my first one, though, is a species tulip, which um, I love species tulips. The blue-eyed tulip, and I'm going to butcher the name, the Alba Coriulia oculata. Did I, yes. Okay. Yep. Did I get close? <laughs> yes, you did, actually. You did. Oh, well, it's all about communicating, and I understood exactly I, what you meant. I feel you. Oh, spectacular. That blue, oh, my gosh. It's just it's, it's That insane. steel blue base is just it takes my breath away. It's absolutely beautiful against the glistening white of the petals. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. It's still a rather rare variety, I would say, and it's more expensive than the average bear, but it's absolutely so worth it. I would just say to make sure you plant it in a spot where you're going to be walking nearby so that you can mm-hmm. really observe it close up and personally. Exactly. Um, yeah, because I think a lot of times when one is planting a garden or thinking about what you're going to put where, it might be perfect for the garden. But if you don't go there in April or if you mm-hmm. don't 
walk around that area of your family's property at that time. It could kind of get lost in your normal daily life. So what I try to do is encourage people to plant some of these varieties, particularly the smaller varieties, to plant mm-hmm. them in an area where, where you'll be frequenting that area as part of your daily life more often. That's great advice. I actually try to plant the species tulips right along our walkway going up to the oh, front door so perfect. you can at least see them and not miss them when they bloom. They're so they're just beautiful. I love them. Yeah, they're um, absolutely gorgeous. I, I love that particular variety as well. That one is a treat. That's an amazing one. <laughs> My father added that to our collection. Oh, man, I'm I'm wanting to say 10 years ago, maybe 12 and I remember that when he added it to our collection, he had already been talking about it for, I think, eight years, that he'd been watching oh. it in the field. And, you know, the flower bulb growers don't start selling any bulbs until their planting stock is large enough so that they can continue growing the particular variety on, you know, in ever-increasing ever quantities. And mm-hmm. I just remember how thrilled he was when he added... um this little special bulb to our collection. It was, you know, really a, a feather in its cap, so to say. Well, it is. That's when my mother-in-law was just visiting, and she's, she's from Holland. She's actually in Switzerland now, but she's originally from Holland. And after she, um, the last day she was here, she gave me some mad money for flowers. So oh, that's oh, one, nice. definitely. Oh, I know, isn't she great? She's a great mother-in-law. Yes, she So um, that's definitely, as my list grows, I'm like, thank you, Beth. This is so sweet of you. She's <laughs> <laughs> financing my bold madness here. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, it's a brilliant variety. It is really beautiful. Then um, I'm trying to work harder on extending the color, you know, throughout the, the spring to into early summer here if I can. And it's, you know, it's nice. South Carolina is so nice because I garden all year round. It's really a lucky thing except for when it's 103 degrees out. But, you know, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But um, one of the others that I love, I love the lily flowering tulips, too. I think that the... the um, form is just so elegant and romantic and I just love them and so what I added to my list for that one was a Marianne tulip with a lily flowering shape I just think they're very romantic and pretty and I don't know I don't know so what do you think about that one Joanne? Well I I love lily flowering tulips particularly when they're in combination with other more classically formed tulips they they really show up more almost like birds lighting in your garden. I mean, they're just so ethereal, and the reflex petals are so graceful. Marianne is also an incredible color combination. The first time I saw her was in a bulb field. Again, it was a very cold day, and it was a very dark day. The sun was not out. And I walked behind the barn at this flower bulb field, and all of a sudden, it was the field of Marianne, and it lit up the day as if the sun had come out. But it was such a dark, cold, bone-chilling day, and she just changed the whole ambiance or feeling of of the of the day. It was just amazing how she just ignited the landscape. It was she was incredible. So I, she's beautiful. She's not as lily flowering formed as some of the other varieties like West Point mm-hmm. or White Triumphator, but she still has the graceful arcing of the petals. It's just not as extremely reflexed as some of the other varieties. Yeah, I have to tell you this quickly a story. When I was a very new manager, my friend and I were like the youngest managers at this publishing company. And when we would have a bad day, we would put tulips on each other's desks because, you know, oh. you're 20 years old trying to make your way and they're young and you have no idea what you're doing and they have bad days. And I just remember going and, you know, we'd pick up those cheap little bunches at the grocery stores when they'd be in season and just stick them on each other's desk. And I mean, this tulips just have that, that happiness factor. Every time I see one, you just can't help but be pleased with your day when you have them on your desk or when you have them in your kitchen or in your garden. (laughs) But it also makes other people think like, think that you have your act together that, (laughs) <laughs> you're you're so polished and you're so like 
into your own <laughs> life and are on top of everything that you have fresh flowers in your kitchen or on your desk. Because like, I am just so polished in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I may not clean the house. The house might be dirty, but I have fresh flowers in it. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to leave my tulips, even though I love them. And I I have the same issue. Lots. Of, we live in the middle of a forest. So we have lots of beer, lots of bowls. I'm adding some some daffodils here into the mix, and I love um, dream light. The small cup, it's so pretty and cheerful. Yeah, and it's so fine. It's like to me, some of the small cups with such refined, delicate cups. I mean, it's edged with that little minuscule, ruffly edge of like a pinky orange color has kind of a green eye. And the, to me, they're like garden jewelry. And it's also the form of the petals. The petals on Dreamlight are more rounded and overlapping. So it creates like just such an impact when you look at it. And again, it's so refined and delicate. It just, they're beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It's also later flowering. Mm-hmm. Which I I like later flowering varieties very much because people normally are outside more in late spring than in early spring, and so I think having later flowering varieties blooming in the garden are very nice because people are more apt to be out in the garden than you know maybe having lunch in the garden or you know just hanging out more together as a family in in the garden. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I'm really trying, especially with my daffodils, I'm so happy when they start appearing. But in South Carolina, they can start appearing as early as even, you know, mid to late January. So I'm really working on trying to get that season extension because, you know, when I did the first big mass planting, I was so bereft after they were done. I'm like, oh, no, where did all my daffodils go? So I'm really working hard to try to lengthen that season too. So I mean, there are many later flowering varieties now, so you can really kind of diversify with height and, you know, they're single stem varieties. They're also multi-flowering varieties, some of which have a fragrance, which is more pronounced in the warmth than in cold temperatures. So I think that there are many more choices available now for later flowering varieties than there ever used to be. I, you know, and I think I skipped one, didn't I? The Blushing Beauty Tulip? Yeah, Did I mention blushing, it already? No, you didn't. And I was, I'm I was sorry. Gonna, gonna bring I'm bring it up that. because it's one of those late varieties that yeah. has, it's so beautiful. It's a bicolor. It's a two-tone, kind of a raspberry and golden yellow color. It's part of a, a class of tulips called Lefevre varieties. And they're really tall, which I, I love think it. Is so fabulous. So it can grow up to 30 inches tall. The stems are pretty strong. I wouldn't plant them in a really windy spot because of their height. They would be, you know, swaying and dancing in the breeze and knocking their heads together. But they're just fabulous, and they're they're perfect for long stem bouquets. You know, in big floor vases, they're they're pretty spectacular. I have to say. I love that. And I'm sorry I skipped that because that was one in particular. I was thinking I wanted something a little later with the tulips, things I could cut. I have a um, an area, too. It's so hard because when I plant for landscape, I want to go and cut some, but then I can't bring myself to do it. So I have a cutting garden, too, in the back oh, by the perfect. kitchen garden. Yeah. So then I don't feel so guilty, you know, going and harvesting for bouquets. So no, you're, so smart. Um, you're so smart to do that. A cutting garden. I finally I'm yeah, And I'm awesome. really working on it. I want it to be something that I can just kind of keep going out and harvesting and finding some beautiful things to add to it, too. So. And it's also and it's a great funny. way to experiment with new varieties for your display gardens. So instead of, yeah. you know, planting 500 of this or that variety, you can plant groups of, of 10 of different varieties and see which makes your heart sing the most. Then now I've got to get back into where I had my tie. And I'm very sorry for that. But I love Iris Reticulata Harmony. I have that one. I don't have a lot of it. So that was kind of my plan is I really want to expand to make a nice bed with that because everyone who sees it just loves it. I think they're so pretty. And then um, I yeah. love that Cyrus. I'm just, yeah. I could, I could have bouquets of them all over the house with my tulips and be so happy. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And it's one of the most widely used 
cut flowers by American florists as well. Most spring bouquets that one would find in the United States always have Dutch iris in them. If you have to choose between both of them, I personally would go with Iris Reticulata Harmony. Not that I don't love Dutch Iris, I do, but Harmony, I still cannot imagine how these little bulbs planted four inches from the surface of the soil come up at the end of winter, regardless of ice storms, late snowfalls, whatever, They bloom their hearts out. They can get covered by ice and snow. It melts, and they're back again, just as if the snowstorm hadn't happened. And they're so delicate. I just adore them, and I can't think of anything better than being greeted at the the end of winter before spring has really even started than by seeing Iris Reticulata Harmony. And that really is in our garden. It's probably one of the first ones that appears of all of the bulbs just in South Carolina, at least. So Absolutely. It gives yeah, you the strength really like to it. get through, you know, some monochromatic days before the rest of the garden um, bursts into color. That's absolutely true. And look how beautifully you described that, the monochromatic days. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Well, and um, I guess it, there's a few questions I had for you, too. For my cutting garden, where I'm going to have my pretend flower farm for now, what do you think are your favorite What's us say maybe favorite tulips that you love for the case. I adore um, single light tulip Dordogne. It's a combination color of orange and pink. It's actually one mm. of the sheepers hybrids um, that was hybridized out of Mrs. John T. Sheepers. Mm. And they all have the really large, long, chalice-shaped blooms. They're very strong. I love, I love Dordogne so much. And Francoise another sheepers hybrid, a single light that's white with a yellow base. And I love Maureen and Menton, which are amongst the latest of the blooming flowers. And I love peony flowering tulips. Yeah, it gives you that really full, lush, you know, crinoline petticoat kind of look with the statuesque single lates. They they have an overlapping bloom time, so it gives texture. And then white triumphator, which is um, one of the more extravagantly reflexed flowers, so it gives you that elegance and the, the form that is different also from the peonies and the single eight. Great. I grow um, Angelique, and I love that from the peony flowering. Oh, my gosh. And I had a friend actually say, why are your peonies so early? I'm like, that's not a peony. <laughs> I mean, it was not. And where's all the foliage? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think I had done like a close-up photo of it, and then they commented on it like, why do you have peonies already? I'm like, no, no. I don't. <laughs> I shouldn't even be able to grow peonies, but, you know, in South Carolina, but I still do it because I have to try. So, and then my other question was, I'm really lucky in that, you know, I have grown for market. Um, so I have a couple little greenhouses on in our backyard too. Oh, and I'm dying to try to grow some in the greenhouse over the winter. So what would you recommend for that? Well, what, basically what you'd be doing is forcing flower bulbs. And mm-hmm. if you were interested in forcing tulips, you would want to select from among three different classes of tulips. Single early tulips, double early tulips, and mm-hmm. triumph tulips. And what you're basically doing is replicating the natural winter climate of a z- horticultural zone five. I believe you're in a late seven, early eight. Are exactly. You? That's exactly okay. where I am. We haven't changed over to 8A yet, but we're getting close to it. So. Okay. So what would happen, so what you want to do is, let's say you're going to do tulip bulbs. In mid-October, you want to pot up the tulip bulbs that you've selected from those three classes and pot with a drainage hole and neutral pH sandy loam, and you want to cover the tips of the tulip bulbs with about two inches of soil and okay. give it a little drink. But the trick is you have to put them into a cold environment at a consistent 38 to 44 degree temperature in the dark. And the problem with putting, keeping pots or containers outside is that there's significant temperature spiking, particularly if you're in South Carolina. Yeah, the dumb bulbs won't know, am I supposed to grow roots or am I supposed to grow top growth? <laughs> 
and they go back and forth and back and forth, and then they just give up. Or mm. they start growing roots because it's cool, it's significantly and consistently cool, then you could get, maybe not in South Carolina, but then if there's an Arctic temperature spike, it can freeze, and just like asphalt gets torn apart and potholes emerge in the spring from freezing and thawing, it tears apart immature root systems, and without roots, you might get foliage, but very rarely would you ever get a flower. Sad. So yeah. <laughs> Poor little bulbs. I don't want to yeah. do that to them. <laughs> so the trick is, um, if you have an extra refrigerator or a cooling unit, that mm-hmm. would be what you would want to do. You'd want to put the pots that you've prepared into a consistent, cold, dark temperature. Um, in the past, when that was not available to people, they used to trench in the bulbs or heal them in. So then you would dig mm-hmm. a trench in your garden about a foot deep, let's say, and then you uh-huh. would put the pots in the trench and cover them with a combination of sand and evergreen boughs. So you'd need to protect them from temperature spiking, but you'd need to cover them in such a way that you could shovel them out without damaging the pots and the plants. You know what? I am lucky because we do have a second fridge in the oh. garage that we just Perfect. use like to keep cold drinks and things like that. That might become my new, <laughs> everyone else might not get to use it anymore. It might just be mine. It's perfect. <laughs> That's oh, perfect. exciting. You're I lucky. should try it. I'll have to let you know how it goes. I'm so excited. Yep. And Iris Reticulata <laughs> Harmony is a very good one for forcing as well. <gasps> oh, oh, my gosh. Lotta. I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I am I am like Christmas when my bulbs come in, you should see. I take pictures of them. I'm it's crazy. Just when the when the orders arrive, I yeah. literally take pictures of all the boxes like I'm opening Christmas presents. It just makes Aww. me so happy. <laughs> I am I am that big of a nerd, I swear. <laughs> but it's a good it's a good habit. It's good. <laughs> It's very good. Thank I'm you, so Joanne. That is so much fun. I love talking so with you. Awesome. This has been this is so great. I am just taking notes all over the place. Same here. Now my list is longer. <laughs> I think all of our lists are longer. Oh my gosh. Well, what? next up we have Susan Ballenweider. Susan, why don't you go ahead and share your top five picks from the Color Blends catalog? I will do that. I had a couple beds that I could fill out this year with different things. So the first one that I had, I have an allium bed in the back of my house. And so I wanted to add more hot, big ones. So I picked a tall, big globe allium mixture uh, to add a little bit more color and height into that flower bed. Well, I'm particularly fond of the huge statuesque balloon shaped allium It's one of my favorite times in the garden, in all honesty. Um, I can't imagine how gardens can be happy without those huge globes appearing in, um, usually in in a horticultural zone five in Connecticut, it would be in uh, May, in a a normal spring, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just incredible planetoid orbs of composite flowers that are usually in either purple or ivory. They're just incredible. I can't say enough about them. Animals don't eat them. Deer don't eat them. The only thing you have to do is make sure children don't come by with scissors because they think they're balloons and they want to play with them. (laughs) So that was a good pick. Yeah. Uh, okay, my next pick was a Kamasia Quamish Blue Melody, which I probably just mispronounced. And I wanted to add it into that same bed. It gets uh, southern exposure. It's fairly dry. Uh, it has some oranges in it. And, again, the alliums. I wanted to kind of put the uh, Kamasia towards the front of that bed. And that's, that's an incredibly interesting choice. Kamasia is a Northwest United States native. Um, there are not that many native flower bulbs. Um, earlier we talked about Allium and Plectin's Graceful Beauty. Um, Kamasia is native to the Pacific Northwest. Blue Melody is one of the more unusual varieties 
because it has, again, incredibly showy um, center stage marginated foliage. So from amongst this um, low-growing mound of marginated foliage are flowering racemes of purple-blue composite flowers. They, it first looks like it's a stem with blue cigar-shaped buds stuck to it, and then they open from the bottom up, and they're um, long flowering in that regard, that the buds open from the bottom up to the tip of the flowering racemes. Camasia is also interesting from, you know, a, a flower bulb perspective because it can handle soil with a little bit more moisture, which is very nice because most flower bulbs hate getting wet feet. Yes. Is there a trick to keeping bulbs dry or siting bulbs? It's more of a observational <laughs> trick, I think. You know, like keeping your eyes open and seeing, you know, where on your property are there areas that look like little ponds or lakes after a, a big rainfall? I mean, no bulb likes to be planted in an area of standing water, but Camasia can handle areas with more water than most flower bulbs can handle. So, for example, I planted my Camasia near a um, downspout at our house so that when there are big rains, that area could drown some other types of bulbs but Kamasia seemed to like it just fine. Interesting. All right, next. Uh, my next selection was I have a lot of irises down in my rose beds because they come up before the roses actually do around here. So I wanted to add some more blues to those. And I have a Dutch iris blue magic, which I just thought was just striking. It was this dark blue with a yellow center. And I wanted to put it with some white irises that I have. I just thought that together they'd just be this striking uh, dark blue and, and white statement in this, in this iris bed. Yeah, and we talked about how fabulous Dutch iris are as cut flowers. And Blue Magic is no exception. It's an extremely vivid, mm-hmm. yeah, cornflower blue, bright blue, purple blue, like fluorescent blue with yellow blotches, for lack of a better word, on the stems. And they're they're absolutely beautiful in the garden as well as cut flower arrangements. And that is a fantastic pick. All right. Uh, my next one, I have a, I have a lot of daffodils in the front of my house. It's kind of my thing. It's daffodil land up there in, in the spring, and it's just so cheery and bright. Uh, I wanted to add some smaller ones to the front of those daffodils, some mini daffodils. I don't have a lot of those. So I like the narcissus, I'm not even going to pronounce that B word, golden bells. They were mini, and they, I just thought just along the front of that bed, it would just be, you know, finish it off a little bit. That's a, 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 an extremely diminutive, delicate little variety. I think it grows to only about six inches tall. So it's, it's a very dainty accent variety of Narcissi, I would say. It's beautiful in forced pots if you have an extra refrigerator and you want to, you know, just have some delicate pots that do not have really tall flowers in them, like for a, a, a dining table, let's say. But it's, again, it's a very small variety, and they, they really look like petticoat hoops. It used to be called a yellow hoop petticoat. Hmm. But they're very, like, trumpet-shaped, flared um, little flowers. They're just dainty and exquisite. Wow. And I have crocus that I plant in my yard, Um, and some of them didn't make it over the last few years, so I'm kind of restocking them, and I love the big uh, crocus, the crocus vernus pickwick. I thought that, uh, you know, crocuses, they come up first, and a lot of times they pop through the snow, and it's just like, spring's coming, we made it through the winter, and so I wanted to beef up my crocus display. So I thought that that with those big bulbs would be, the big flowers, rather, would be really, really good for that. Um, Crocus Furnace Pickwick is a purple and lavender white striped large flowering crocus or Dutch crocus to be distinguished from species crocus, which bloomed two weeks earlier than the Dutch crocus. So if you're driving about and you see a lawn covered with glistening purple and white and yellow little gems of crocus, they're usually species crocus. 
um, which are perfect for lawn plantings because you can mow your lawn two weeks earlier than the big Dutch uh, crocus vernus varieties. And Pickwick is one of the Dutch crocus vernus varieties, so Pickwick is better for path side plantings, you know, in front of stone walls, garden borders, but you wouldn't want to plant the Dutch crocus furnace varieties like Pickwick in the lawn because then you have to wait to mow your lawn two weeks later and some people really don't like doing that. Because of the, the foliage. Right. So you have to leave the foliage to die back naturally to brown out or yellow out naturally, which can take, again, depending on the temperature, it can take a good five weeks, six weeks. And some people are much more apt to want to keep their lawns really closely manicured in the spring. Okay. And then uh, Susan had a couple of questions. Yeah. What are your thoughts on adding something like blood meal to when you're planting the bulbs? Or is there anything else that you would recommend that would help them along? We're rather conservative with this question. We think that it's best to prepare your planting site by loosening the soil, making sure there's adequate drainage. The sandy loam is the best type of soil for flower bulbs. And to never put anything in the bottom of the hole. To just, as I said, get the soil prepared and then nestle the little bulb in there, making sure that the soil is worked enough so that the baby roots can have room to grow. And then filling the hole with soil, tamping it down lightly, and then using a more balanced composition of organic granular fertilizer, more of a 4106 or a 5105 composition. And the reason for that is that at all costs, you want to prevent the possibility of root burn. So when the bulb goes down into the base of the hole, the basal plate of the bulb from which the roots emerge, you want it really in the soil, not touching any fertilizer, even if it's organic, because it could cauterize kind of the the base of the bulb and prevent the development of little baby roots. And well, blood meal, of course, is um, it can it can also attract animals, rodents, etc. Okay. Now, when we first started the interview, I remember you talking about being in the business with your dad, and you mentioned all the fish emulsion. What do you do with that? Fish emulsion is a natural fertilizer that is used to amend and enrich the soil. It's usually used, the concentrate fish emulsion is usually watered down, and I think these days it's more commonly used in vegetable gardening than um, ornamental flower gardening. I use it. I use it with all my transplants that I start on the greenhouse, yep. and they, yeah. they do really well. They do really yep. well with yeah, it. It smells absolutely. disgusting. It's, it's so the worst smell. <laughs> I was 10 years old, and I had to clean up smash cartons of fish emulsion. It was yeah. so yeah. horrible. I had to use it on a on my seedlings and and I was like oh I'll just use a little and it smelled for like three days and my poor husband yeah. he was like it's what awful. did you do <laughs> oh no it's horrible and it needs to, it really awful. needs to be watered down same thing yeah. with manure tea it's like really mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 it's very funny you know my youngest did his science fair project testing the viability of like which or organic product produce the best by measuring pea seedlings and all this and fish emulsion oh. and oh boy when he had to when he had to do the fish emulsion though he's like mom can you help me do this i'm like no it's your science no, it was it. Your <laughs> idea. And what, was his, what was his conclusion i have to tell you annie haven's moo poo tea one here i've been using fish emulsion on my transplants this entire time i use hers in the garden typically after they're more established Oh, and no. he tested he tested five different organics. Annie's product was the one that won. It was great. So I'm really happy because I love her. And he was very scientific about it. I was pretty Good impressed. With that kid. How old is he? Yeah. He's now 11. He did it when he was 10. So, yeah, it was a great. Yeah. It was good for me. And it was a really practical thing because I'm like, well, 
now I know I will be using this on my transplants instead of the uh, fish emulsion. It made me happy. And the other thing is when one plants flower bulbs the first year, it's really like a perfect little bundle from Mother Nature. Everything that the bulb needs to grow and flower the next year are already inside of the bulb with the exception of the roots, which need to go down and outside the bulb. But everything else is really inside the bulb, and it just it needs to be planted, good mature root growth, water, and even the soil nutrients aren't as important the, the first year as the mature root growth, the minim, you know, minimal consistent watering. And it's for the future years that the organic fertilizer that's broadcast as really like bird seed is, is so valuable for, for the future of perennial plantings and naturalizers. Good to know. Yeah, tremendous information here. Um, here's Susan's uh, next question. My question is, how do you plant bulbs in the grass, in the lawn, without ripping up all the sod? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a really good, easy way of recommending this. <laughs> Some people will lift up flaps of sod. So they'll dig down and across at a much deeper level than like your normal roll of sod because they don't want to destroy the root system, of course, the, the fine net of roots. But that is really quite an endeavor. Crocus bulbs, for example, planted in a lawn. You can also plant iffian by the way, which is, is a lovely effect as well. But crocus bulbs should be around four inches deep. So you'd have to do, I don't know, a three-inch layer off the top. So that's pretty significant. Otherwise, they're planted individually. I'm not really big on using long-handled bulb planting tools. I don't, I don't find they work too much. I usually do the old crawl on your knees with a hand tool method. And I usually do a section of the lawn a year, <laughs> keep it manageable. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by the end of my life, the whole lawn's covered. Hmm. Th that's exactly what Tim said uh, when we spoke to him earlier. He said, do a section at a time. Don't kill yourself. Yep, absolutely. I, that's kind of my approach on most things gardening. You know, 80% of plant material, in my mind, should be perennial or naturalizing in nature so that every year you're not recreating the whole wheel all the time. And to keep gardening fun and healthy for one's body and to really keep it part of your family's life, to do a certain amount that makes you happy and not kill yourself and leave time for yourself to enjoy it and maybe do 20% with annuals, but to work toward that 80% perennial and naturalizers so that um, you don't feel like a you know weekend warrior damaged drudge by the end of gardening, yeah, which can right. happen. I yeah. can tell you from personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard when you get those images in your mind of what it could look like, and you work so hard to accomplish it all, but I think the multi-phase approach, like Tim said, is the best way to do it. Yeah. Well, for my picks, after our interview with Tim, I went back to the way that I have been functioning and I went 100% Narcissus because okay. <laughs> I can count on them. I can count on them. I don't have to be so worried about critters. They're going to come back. And then I, I did cheat just a little bit because I started Googling top Narcissus picks for the Midwest. Oh. And I was reading uh, different lists that uh, have been published through the years. And there was a really good one on Midwest Living. I'll have to link to that. That's, this is how, yeah, I, oh, it is such a good publication. I think people would enjoy that even if they weren't living in the Midwest. It doesn't matter where you live. Yeah, it's like it Southern Living. Where you live. Yeah, it's yeah, like Southern right. Living. You, I read that and I'm, I'm not in the South at all. So, well, so let me walk you through this list of supposedly top Narcissus for the Midwest. And uh, the first one is, okay, is this a Dutch name? Is it Reinveld's Early Sensation? Reinveld's Early Sensation. It's a Dutch word. It's a Dutch word. Well, there you go. Yeah. Reinveld's Early Sensation. Yeah. <laughs> 
And that's a great variety. It's not being as widely grown in the Netherlands as it used to be, but it's a terrific variety. It's a bit shorter in stature than many of the other trumpet daffodils. When one says it's a trumpet daffodil, it means that the trumpet is as long as the flower petals or longer. So it has a very prominent cup or crown in the form of a trumpet, and it has more starry-shaped flower petals. But again, it's a little bit, it's it's shorter than most of the other trumpets, but it's wonderful because it blooms a good two weeks earlier than the others as well. I love that you have criteria around trumpets. Yeah, it's, well, it's not, they're not my um, criteria. It's the Royal Horticultural Society and the American Daffodil Society. They break Narcissi into 13 divisions. And the first division is trumpet daffodils. And they define trumpet daffodils by saying that the trumpet-shaped cup has to be at least as long as the flower petals if you cup the flower or longer. Wow. Okay, so we know one of the 13. Phew. Okay. Yep. One down, 12 to go. Dirty dozen to go. To tell you the other 12? <laughs> oh my gosh. I would, but I think uh, the show will end up being five hours long. I know. <laughs> not, that, not that I couldn't handle that. I could go all night. I'm just thinking about everybody else here. Um, well, can I tell you one thing? Okay, go for um, it. Okay. Um, divisions. <laughs> Division seven is Jonquil and Narcissi. So trumpet daffodils, as as you saw um, on your from your research, were more prevalent in the Midwest and in, in the northern tier of the United States. So trumpet daffodils was abbreviated, shortened to daffodils. The people in the northern part of the United States were more apt, apt to call Narcissi daffodils. Where in the south. Jonquil and Narcissi thrive better in more warmer climates. And so in the South, people started calling Narcissi Jonquils. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Julie, are you hearing that? Are you hearing that where you're I'm at? I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. My Jonquils will be very happy to know this. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I'm a Northern girl. That's the problem. You know, I'm transplanted here, so I don't know. Oh, that's right. I'll have to, I'll have to relearn it. (laughs) It's just a little flower bulb factoid. Yeah. I love flower bulb factoids. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So the next one that I picked is Narcissus, is it Thalia? And is that a uh, Dutch name? Is it a female Dutch name? Um, no, I've never heard anyone by the name of Thalia. Okay. Maybe it's an English name. I don't know. I think it might be a girl's name. I'm not positive. Yeah, that was but my immediate is, reaction. I thought it might be a girl's yeah, name. Yeah, I think so. Thalia is one of the most exquisite varieties. It's it's from the triandrous class of Narcissi. It's a later blooming variety. It blooms more late April, early May, in Connecticut anyway. And it's a multi-flowering variety, also known as the orchid Narcissus. And it can have up to five rather pendant, glistening white flowers with slightly reflexed, almost star-shaped flowers. But it's absolutely wonderful. It's born on slender stems, and it's as perfect in boxwood parterres as it is in naturalized drifts in the garden or on the edge of woodlands. It's brilliant, and a single stem with multiple flowers is perfect in a little vase. It's it's one of the best all time varieties, I think. Did you hear that, Frau Zenny? She said it was exquisite. It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't handle there's too many pretty things. <laughs> I know. Okay. Well, I already know what Julie's dreaming about tonight. Julie's gonna wake up in the morning and she'll she'll have been dreaming right at the moment where the box of bulbs has arrived and just when she's about to open it, she's gonna wake up and be like, What? Where are my bulbs? <laughs> yeah, where are my bulbs? No. <laughs> okay, Narcissus Ice Follies. This has a connection to your family. Yes, my family's nursery in the Netherlands hybridized it decades ago. I think it was in the sixties. And it's one of the most commonly planted narcissi in the United States, if not the world. 
It's a mid-season bloomer. It's a terrific naturalizer. It opens with a yellow cup that matures to ivory, and it just radiates the sun in the garden like it's so many sparkling little suns. It's it might be widely planted, but it's still just as special as it ever was. And you had mentioned in our pre-chat that the price of the bulb is not an indicator of how good the bulb is. Absolutely not. The, the best growing bulbs in the fields of the Netherlands require less time to mature into top size bulbs, so the grower has less work and time involved with the top size harvest. So it's more economical from a growing perspective, and therefore we can charge more reasonable prices versus some of the newer varieties, which might need to be pampered and helped along until they're more plentifully grown. See, isn't that a little known bulb fact right there? Yeah. (laughs) Um, How about Narcissus Salome? It's a gorgeous variety. It's a mid-season bloomer with a beautiful ivory circle of petals around an apricot pink cup, which is a horticultural pink, not a ballerina pink. It's more of an apricot pink and with a delightfully edged rim of the cup, which gives it a really beautiful glow and charm. It's, It's lovely. How about Narcissus geranium? That was my geranium is an incredibly fragrant variety, so it's a it's a very nice pick because not only is it a good grower and it's it's a showy variety with a well contrasting orangey kind of cup against a very full, well overlapping parents or petals, but the fragrance is just divine, and it, it's obviously more fragrant on warmer spring days. Uh, particularly in a breeze when the fragrance can waft around than on a cooler spring day. So it's a nice twofer to get the fragrance as well as the beauty of the flower. Okay, so here were our listener questions. I okay. will go through them quickly here. Uh, the first is, what is Van England's best-selling bulb? Oh, heavens. <laughs> the first that comes to mind on the tulip side would be tulip pink impression, tulip angelique. I, I, those are the first two that, that come to mind. I would have to say, as a class of tulips, I would say the giant Darwin hybrid tulips, of, of which pink impression is one. For narcissi, I would have to say the trumpet daffodils and the large cup narcissi, the King Alfred sorts of, of solid yellow trumpets, as well as um, trumpet daffodil Mount Hood, which is the white variety, opens with a yellow cup which turns white. And Thalia, that we that we talked about before, Thalia is extremely popular. She is. Oh, absolutely. Now, this one's from my neighbor across the street. She uh-huh. asks, is it okay to braid the leaves? No. <gasps> No, it's not okay. Um, What about a French twist? What about a French twist? (laughs) Did you hear that pause? We're all like, oh, no. no." We're all furiously (laughs) braiding. (laughs) Yeah. First of all, it's a finicky thing, and who has the time? Second of all, it's a minute. Uh, Amen. Thank you. I had the time. I was taking my time. I was doing it. Oh, goodness. Um, Oh, my God. But from a... uh, from a horticultural perspective, what you're doing is diminishing the surface area of the foliage and you're diminishing photosynthesis and chlorophyll production so that you're hampering the bulb growth. Oh, of course we are. That makes complete sense. Yeah. But the, so the answer is no. <laughs> okay. So much for hairstyling and flowers. This concludes this episode and that's a great answer. No, I like that. You know, when you when you hear an answer like that, this is what slays me about gardening is when you hear an answer like that, you realize that gardening is so intuitive. And it's just all these little antics that we somehow stumble on and then we just kind of lose our minds, don't we? 
Well, <laughs> that I, is so true. <laughs> my father always told me that flower bulbs perform the best the less human beings do to them. <sighs> just plant them. Don't put anything in the hole. Just plant them in nice garden soil. Give them some sun. And they'll do everything for you. The more human beings fuss with them and do little things, it just gets in the way of Mother Nature. Uh, as wow, it is with many things. that's something I could get behind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Less is more. I like it Yeah, less much. is more. Joanne is the parent of uh, four teenagers. I think that advice applies at times to the kids. So <laughs> <laughs> give them a little space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I yeah, like to tell so them funny. right now my favorite thing to tell them is I can teach you or God can teach you. Either way you'll learn. <laughs> is that is that a nice way of saying we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way? That's the nice way mm. of saying you don't want to wear that winter coat that I bought you and we live in Minnesota. Okay. <laughs> As I stomp we'll back learn. into the house. Yep, you'll learn. Get nice don't and come kind to me when you have frostbite. That's right. <laughs> Hey, and speaking of that, the next question is from Mary, and she wrote, how late can I plant? I mean, can she be digging through two feet of snow? (laughs) Clearly not, but how late can she push it to get those bulbs in the ground? Um, In a nutshell, one should plant flower bulbs when the ground is about 55 degrees, which is usually after about two weeks of sweater weather when the nighttime temperatures have hovered in in around 40 degrees, but you can plant tulips even if you get a a period of warmth and thawing in January, but most other flower bulbs really should be planted in the fall before the ground has started to freeze. Okay, now here's a question from Bob, and he's asking, how many bulbs are coming over from Holland on ships right now? Millions and millions and millions. Really? I can tell you, I can't go into exact numbers, but I can tell you that we import alone over 20 million bulbs. Holy cow. Holy cow. And they're all going to Julie's house, aren't they? (laughs) They're all going to my house. I'm so happy. Planting party at Julie's. It's good. She's actually changing the route of one of those ships. It's coming into the Charleston port. I feel it. <laughs> it's so oh many God, millions. Oh my God. It's so oh many God. millions of flower bulbs. Millions. I, wow. I've wow. never even entertained that question in my own mind before. But I can tell you that we import over 20 million every year. And that's just your company. And that's just our companies. Yeah. Holy cow. It's a huge amount of flower bulbs. It's huge. <laughs> wow. Goodness. Yeah. You know, you have to also add in, you know, cut flower growers in the United States that are growing, you know, rather large fields of varieties for cut flower bouquets for the florist trade, as well as potted plant production for all the pots of flowers that one can find in the spring for Easter, for example. So, it's, you know, the bulbs that we sell are for dry sale only, but there are other people importing huge amounts for potting and forcing as well as for cut flower production. So it's massive. That's crazy. Wow. My yeah, model. I can't even imagine that many. Yeah. I can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was perfect. That was spot on. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting slap happy thinking about bulbs. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What's your list up to now? Are you in the 40s yet? I love carry it. about 800 varieties, so you have some room to grow. Yeah, she has time. I do. But if I only had the room to grow, that's the problem. I'm running out of room to grow. <laughs> I live in the middle of a forest with beach oh. shade. <laughs> it's really a very tricky thing. <laughs> oh, but it's okay. I'll make it work. It'll work. It's fine. <laughs> Joanne, what did we miss? Is there any standouts in your mind that you're like, huh, I'm really surprised these gals didn't pick this one? Well, there's some types of flower bulbs that are not as widely planted as others. Brodea is one. 
also classified as the cello stemma and tritillea. They bloom in May, June, and they're absolutely wonderful. We've talked about deer-resistant bulbs. Some varieties of flower bulbs uh, perform better in more filtered sunlight or shade. So that's an important consideration when you're looking around your garden and, you know, deciding um, how much of your forest you want to plant. Um, I'm going to plant it all. (laughs) Plant it all. (laughs) (laughs) Then you can think about some other varieties like Erythronium pagoda, Aranthus hyamalis, Corydalus. Uh, geranium tuberosum, oxalis. There's all kinds of varieties of special little flower bulbs that can handle a little bit more filtered sunlight. Not dense shade necessarily, but right. they handle. And I, I think what we talked about, wanting to plant your garden sequentially so that you have something blooming early spring, middle spring, late spring, and then going into the summer, of course, with all sorts of um, imperious lilies. Um, mm-hmm. Orient lilies are taking over the gardening world. They can grow six to eight feet tall. They're more like small saplings than um, <laughs> lilies. <laughs> uh, so you know, there 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 are more varieties than tulips and and narcissi. Certainly, we've talked about crocus, muscari, fritillaria are incredible. Um, I love them. Love oh, them. And they come in all heights and forms. Um, Fritillaria meleagris is, you know, around 10, 12 inches tall and has little dainty pendant um, bell-shaped flowers. Fritillaria crown imperialis um, grows to about three feet tall, and they have incredible stems with pendant florets um, at the top with a tuft of wild foliage. Fritillaria persica, of course, is plum, so dark plum colored, almost black, and there, it's flowering racemes um, of flowers. Again, the pendant, the bell-shaped nodding flowers. So they're all different types of unusual flower bulbs. Um, Fritillaria in particular is very useful in areas with deer populations because deer don't like fritillaria either, nor do rodents, which is very nice for those of us with voles. Yes. Um, so mm-hmm. the, there are, it, it's a, it's a wow. huge expanse of special little miscellaneous or minor bulbs um, that come in very handy. I would say more as accent plantings, let's say. We talked about allium that can get incredibly tall. They can grow four to six feet tall and provide natural garden architecture. Fritillaria can can do the same, have the same effect in the garden. Yeah, so there's a, a, a huge di- diversity to experiment with, which is really fun and it keeps gardening alive. There is. And, you know, you mentioned when we started the show, before we went live, you mentioned that your catalogs start shipping out to customers the first week in June and that... Now, I'm not saying we know that anyone on this call falls into this category, um, but there are people there are people that that place their orders or get their re- reservations in right away, even though you're not able to ship until right. you know later in August. So how does yeah. that process work? I mean, what are they reserving? What on earth could they be reserving? They, well, it's basically people who have very clear ideas of, of what they want to plant in the fall. Um, perhaps they've been sold out of special varieties that are not grown in large quantities. Maybe they've been disappointed by a sold out in the past. Okay. But I would say for the most part, it's people perhaps with larger gardens that need larger quantities of individual varieties and want to make sure that they put their dibs on them. We don't charge credit cards until we prepare orders for shipment in the fall. So there's no cost associated with reserving orders, nor is there even a firm commitment. If someone places an order with us in June, they're reserved until they tell us they've changed their mind and they prefer something else or until we ship their order. So placing an early reserve order There's no downside to it, so many people do that. Not as many as in the past. In the past, we likely um, reserved half of our orders by Labor Day, 
um, these days with mm-hmm. Amazon.com and instant everything, people, I think, are placing their order in general later and later in the season because they've grown accustomed to being able to do that so easily with, you know, readily available um, and timely shipments. Oh, that's a great point. Didn't even think about that. That has a big impact on your business. Yeah. Well, it's, it's sometimes it's, um, it's challenging because I place my orders and reserve our inventory with the flower bulb growers in February based on prior year demand and popularity and some intuition about trends and colors and types of plant material. And then fortunately over the summer, as I see any other actual trends developing, I can increase my orders of certain varieties as, as people, you know, are placing their reserve orders. Wow. A lot wow. goes into this. Yeah. <laughs> you were just saying how you get like hunches about color. Or what do you feel are the popular colors for this coming growing season? My first response would be to say in the oranges, I'm seeing a lot of people doing interesting things with Tulip King's Orange, Tulip Dordogne again, Tulip Christmas Orange. So on the tulip side, it's a lot of oranges, but purples are also rather big again. That's that's what I would <laughs> say for, for tulips anyway. That's, that's cool. interesting that you said that, Joanne, because I was talking to one of my horticultural clients that I write for, and she said the exact same thing about the oranges, that that's really, right. she thinks that's going to be the thing next year for her, her product, too. It's really interesting. Yeah. So. That's, that's what I'm, sure. that's the Good. I'm getting from, from the sales that we've had so far. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. I was just curious. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, Joanne, what are one or two pieces of advice that you have for gardeners who are ordering bulbs this year? I guess something we, we talked about earlier about keeping it manageable and focusing on 80% perennial plant material and 20% more um, annual varieties like, like tulips, which, which peter out, yeah. just to keep it manageable, to keep it fun, to think about how you can keep the gardens alive and growing and kind of changing as your family's tastes change. I think that that's a really important element. And also the the timing of of when different types of flower bulbs are blooming so that you don't have one huge explosion of color and flowers and then the letdown of, you know, now it's May and everything's loomed out. What am I going to do now? I think it's Mm -hmm. important to think about staggering the bloom times to keep the garden alive as long as possible before summer perennial plant material bursts into bloom, which is, you know, depending on where one lives, not until late June or even into July. That's a great point. Now, Mm -hmm. if people want to order bulbs either from Van England or John Sheepers, they just go to your website? Yep. We have two secure websites that are just chock full of information and photos. I am a totally addicted photographer and just feel so lucky in my life with what I do and the fact that I can go into the flower bulb fields every year and to the cooking off and to, you know, professional flower shows. I just feel so lucky and I take as many photos as I can to share my experience with like minded souls so that they can, you know, see what everything looks like and see what the process is and you know, get a feeling for it and, you know, catch the bulb bug. Yeah, catch the bulb bug. The other thing is you have an online cookbook that's on your website and you also have a very active Pinterest account where you're not only sharing seeds because you do the kitchen garden seeds, but you also share recipes that you're curating. Yes, we started the Kitchen Garden Seeds Company around 2000. And we've been, we, we basically have been growing it incrementally every year with greater diversity of vegetable, herbs, and flowers in the hope of, of bringing the best varieties to American gardens and kitchens based on 
how well they grow in American gardens, but also on how wonderfully they are to cook with. So we don't have every single main slicing tomato or every single plum tomato, but we carry the ones that we feel are the best, most easily raised in American residential gardens or small market gardens or restaurant gardens, and also the ones that are the most tasty and and well used in the kitchen. I had to speak this morning to a group, and I was talking about one of your products from the kitchen garden, the fraise de bois, the little alpine oh, yeah. strawberries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are tremendous. And I was telling them, you know, you never get those in stores because they're so perishable. You can't even get them at the market. But they're yep. so easy to grow from seed, and they just are wonderful because they're perennials, too. And the fraise de bois, they have the best flavor explosion when you pop one in your mouth that you can't exactly. experience from any of the the larger commercially grown strawberries. It's also true with many types of tomatoes as well, and mm-hmm. some and, and even some eggplant. That there's some varieties of vegetables that they must ripen on the vine, and mm-hmm. therefore they can't be harvested and then have a ripening process during transport or during shelf display. So they they have to really be grown in your in your own garden harvested and used without transport. They're too fragile. They need to ripen on the vine. And it's a it's a huge okay. issue. You think I'm bulb obsessed? One year I grew 184 varieties of heirloom tomatoes. <laughs> oh my it's gosh. like all over the place. <laughs> That's amazing. I've never heard of anyone so doing fun. that. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm that nuts, y'all. I tell you what. <laughs> and what was your favorite? I love yeah. Jean Flamme. And, you know, I have so much shade in our garden. And I find the yellows and the white tomatoes perform really well for me. I yeah. love Jean Flamme. I love black crim. I think that's delicious. I love black semen. I think that is the coolest, weirdest looking tomato, and it's delicious. And, you know, any of the purples and the blacks, I'm going to love those. I don't, I have to tell you, I don't like indigo roast. I just have not. It doesn't have the flavor. Really and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah. From an ornamental perspective, but I, I agree with you. I don't think it's as flavorful, the taste and the texture. I don't it's think kind it's kind of mealy, I found. I thought yeah, it was a little mealy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's all over the place tomatoes, bulbs. <laughs> you have it all. I love your company. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, ladies, I think we we owe a debt of gratitude to our fun, fun evening with Joanne. <laughs> so much. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Time. Thank it's you very much. Great. Joanne, so we know good. how to get a hold of you, but for anyone else who wants to get a hold of you, and, and someone very might well want to reach you after all of this fantastic information you've so generously shared, how do people get a hold of you? They can call me at the office. Um, The phone number there is 860-567-0838. We have a wonderful staff in a little blue Victorian house in front of our warehouse, and they can put anyone straight through to me. And they can also email me at customerservice at johnsheepers.com or customerservice at fenengland.com. I love to talk gardening. I love to talk bulbs. I love to talk recipes from vegetables. It's who we are. We just love to share whatever information we have. And we love to hear from our clients about what's worked for them in their own gardens. If something hasn't worked, we want to know. If something's fabulous, we want to know. It's our passion. It's it's our business, but it's our, our lives too. It's our hobby. It's, yeah. And you're on Facebook, too. What's your account on Facebook, or how do people find you there? You can just do a search for us by company name, John Sheepers, or Van Englund, or Kitchen Garden Seeds. The same thing for our websites. And again, our, our online cookbook on Kitchen Garden Seeds is some of the most fabulous recipes from amazing chefs across the United States that we've met or who, you know, have their own gardens that they share recipes with us or recipes that I created or my father created. And some of our clients have shared their amazing recipes. And we try to keep things like simple and real. It's not like tricky or extra steps that aren't necessary. 
Yeah, we love to hear from our clients all the time. Yeah, and you also said there's someone on staff that used to work at Fine Gardening Magazine that really helps you out with uh, social media in some posts. Oh, Michelle is great. Michelle Gervais works with us. She started with us last fall, and she's, you know, a member of the family now. We have so much fun creating e-newsletters together, whether it's all about, you know, eggplant recipes um, next week or all about what to do with a truckload of cucumbers this week. So we just have so much fun, and she loves taking photographs of food and of, you know, the harvest as well. So she's just a great addition to our team, and we just have a terrific time together. Lance Frazon is our seed specialist, a graduate of Cornell University with, you know, decades of experience in seed selection. He's wonderful. So we have the the bulbs and seeds pretty well covered on our staff and we just have a great time with it. It's really, we're very lucky. Well, speaking of lucky, you are going to be giving away three great gifts for some lucky listeners. The first is your kitchen garden seeds giveaway. You're going to give away a fall treasure chest of things that they can plant this fall and grow or make a tremendous salad. And that's why you call it the fall treasure chest. Uh, And then you have the naturalizing Narcissus flower bulbs. You're going to be giving away a package of that as well as the woodland flower bulbs. Yes. Woodland naturalizers. Woodland naturalizers. That's fantastic. And we look forward to shipping these three collections to your lucky listeners. And we'll we'll ship them at the proper time for planting in their area. And they've got to be in the United States, right? Exactly. It has to be in in the contiguous continental United States. Yeah, just for uh, import-export reasons, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have one last question for you, and I need the help of uh, Jen and Julie with this as well. And my question is, how do you say cheers in Dutch. So if we were going to say cheers to you, how would we say that? Because we're going to do that. (laughs) As our thank you to you. It would be prost. Oh, just like the Germans. Yeah, probably is. Well, there you go. All right, girls. One, two, three. Prost. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank Thank you, you Joanne. Oh, my gosh. We had so much fun. I had so much fun speaking with each of you. Really, It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you, girls, as well. Thank you. So, yeah, we had a good time. Thanks for inviting me, Jen. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Well, that's it for the show today. I want to thank so many people for making this show possible. First and foremost, Joanne vandenberg Ohms of Van England, John Sheepers, and Kitchen Garden Seeds. I could have listened to her talk about her family history in the Dutch bulb business for hours. So maybe we'll have to do a show just on that. I need to recognize Jen McGinnis of the blog Frau Zenny because it was Jen's idea to focus in on color blends and Van England. And without that success, suggestion, I would have never reached out to Tim and Joanne. So that was perfect. I need to recognize Julie Thompson Adolph. She made great selections. And also we could not have found a bigger bulb lover on the planet. So Julie Thompson Adolph of the blog Garden Delights, go and check her blog out. You'll love what you find there. And if you love podcasts and you love history, you will love the History Chicks podcast with my guest, Susan Vollenweider of the History Chicks podcast. She produces that every single week with Beckett Graham, and she's also a columnist with the Kansas City Star. So go ahead and look her up. And I have to recognize Sally Ferguson, who helped pave the way and help me coordinate this show. It had so many moving parts, I just could have never gotten it all put together without Sally's help. I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, Ein Kadena, and David Gregerson. I could not get the show out without them. And just a reminder that I'll have all of the information that was shared on the show today in the show notes on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. That's my website, and it's the home of the Still Growing Podcast. So there's a tab there. You'll see this particular episode, and you'll be able to look at the show notes and find all of the resources that we mention. There's also a link to our Zazzle store where we're selling T-shirts that will be the Team Tulip and Team Daffodil T-shirts. If you're interested in purchasing those to commemorate this two-part episode on our Spring Bulb Party, and 
And if you want to have your own spring bulb party, I will have an attachment, a PDF that you can download with tips, ideas, and suggestions so that you can have as much fun as we did. And I'm going to be using it too for my own personal spring bulb party later this week with garden friends at my house. Speaking of next week, Benedict Van Heems of The Big Bug Hunt and Laura Eubanks of Garden for Serenity will be on the show. Benedict will be talking to us about the Citizen Science Project, the big bug hunt that was started this year. And Laura Eubanks will be talking to us about how to plant a pumpkin, how to use succulents and create a beautiful pumpkin for fall. In the meantime, have fun ordering your bulbs from Van England, John Sheepers, and Kitchen Garden Seeds and Color Blends as well. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.